1950s, small town America. The kind of place where everybody knows your business. And your only career prospect is to become a farmer. And while you sit around in your tractor waiting all day for your dad to die so you can become the boss of the cows. And then you spend the rest of the time daydreaming about getting stinky finger with your sister. Yeah, that's right, Chief. I bet you can almost taste it now. And then on the one day of the week that you got off, you just sit on your porch and you pray to your God for something interesting to happen. But be careful what you pray for. A hillbilly's holiday camp. It was still a small town, part of the Corn Belt that fed America, where the cornfields were still behind people's houses, where you could leave your door open and the only unwanted guest you might get was the neighbor's cat. Well policed, God fearing, with the only crime being an occasional chicken going missing. It was into this God-fearing community that was born the red-headed, bull-legged, one Charles, better known as Charlie Starkweather. Born in 1938, the third child of seven boys and one girl. The Starkweathers, known as white trash, they were the furthest thing from the pillars of the community. Rarely attending church, and if a chicken had gone missing, you knew it would end up on the Starkweathers' table. And although the mother was hard working, the father rarely worked. He spent most of his time stealing chickens. But by all accounts, the children never wanted for love. And Charlie Starkweather remembers an idyllic childhood. Spending his days fishing, playing cowboys and Indians with his brothers. Nothing to indicate that there was anything out of the ordinary in the Starkweather home. To which this day still baffles the eggheads. Because they need something to blame something on. By all accounts, that easy-going child that the Starkweather parents knew changed drastically when he started attending school. Whether it was because he was red-headed, bull-legged, or because early on teachers had diagnosed him as semi-retarded. Either way, when Charlie started school, his personality changed drastically, and he slowly began to evolve from the bullied to the bully, even picking on kids who were bigger than him. The meek and mild child like fishing, was no more. Experts now say that Starkweather shared a character trait along with many other serial killers, and that is his ability to adapt the persona of someone he idolized, in this case, James Dean. And although James Dean had died three years earlier in a car accident, it didn't matter to Charlie. In his mind, he was James Dean. Truly a rebel without a cause. But a teenager, having the feeling of being an outcast in 1950s small town America. It was nothing new. It seemed like it were a generation angry with authority and looking for a way out, even if they had to punch their way out. Fed up with school and all its rules, Stockweather dropped out when he was only 16 years old, and a family friend got him a job as a garbage man. And that's when he met 13-year-old Carol Ann Fugate. By all accounts, a pretty typical young teen for the 50s. Although she'd been disciplined several times, one of those for threatening to kill her art teacher. Yeah, it happens. It was both to the disappointment and concern, Caroline's family, that her and Charlie became inseparable. And like any 13-year-old girl, she was just happy that an older boy was paying her attention. It was early on that the couple realized that the thrills that Lincoln, Nebraska afforded them 
want enough if they wanted to get off. And as Charlie worked on his garbage truck going to the nice middle class areas, Payne probably knew there was no way he was going to achieve that without taking what he wanted. Many of Charlie's friends who remembered him said he was the nicest, sweetest guy you'd ever meet. But if he felt that you defended him, well then he'd take you down. It was just before Christmas that the wannabe James Dean went into a gas station because he wanted to buy Carol a stuffed animal as a Christmas gift. And although the stuffed animal only cost a couple of bucks, well, it might as well have been a million for the garbage man who was making minimum wage. Stockweather begged the attendant to let him buy the stuffed animal on layaway, but the attendant, being new to his position and not recognizing Stockweather, refused. Charlie left enraged, feeling that he'd been humiliated, and started casing out the gas station. And later that day, he returned with a shotgun and a bandana over his face, where he demanded the 21-year-old attendant empty his cash machine, as well as the safe in the back. When Colvert said he didn't know the combination to the safe, Stockweather pistol whipped him, then took the $100 in the cash machine, throwing the bloodied attendant into the trunk of his car. He then drove out to an isolated area, and as the attendant wept and pleaded for his life to be spared, saying that his wife was expecting their first baby. Starkweather made Colvert take the barrel of his gun in his mouth, and then he blew his head clean off. He then threw the headless attendant out of his speeding car and a shotgun into the river, where the police found it a couple of days later. Now hillbilly cops were baffled. Who would blow someone's head off for only a hundred bucks? And for the next two months, Charlie enjoyed his hundred dollars with his now 14-year-old girlfriend, riding a gravy train with biscuit wheels, eating junk food every night, dropping nickels in the jukebox, and buying her every knick-knack her little heart desired. And I guess if she worked on him like she's working on this bottle, maybe Charlie did get a good deal. But that weren't enough to stop the bloodlust, and it wasn't long before the killer struck again, this time a little closer to home. It was on January 21st that Charlie went and picked up a Mickey of whiskey, then went over to Carol's house, where she lived with her mother, her stepfather, and a two-year-old half-sister, where he had planned to take her to go see a movie. But while waiting for Carol to get ready, an argument ensued with her stepfather. And he told Charlie that he was a loser and that he'd never make anything out of himself. And it was good that he was a garbage man, because Carol was trash. But I guess that was taking it a little too far for Charlie. And he pulled out his shotgun and blew off the stepfather's head. Charlie, no! And when the mother and sister started screaming, he shot the mother in the head. Then threw a knife at the child, hitting her in the neck. Then with the butt of his shotgun, he bashed her face to a bloody pulp. He then took the mother, who by all accounts was still breathing, outside to the outhouse and stuffed it down the toilet, which is a pretty shitty way to go. And a two-year-old sister was put in a cardboard box on top of the toilet seat. And the stepfather dumped in the chicken coop where the chickens ate out his eyeballs, which I would consider pretty humiliating, getting eaten by a chicken. Then Charlie, with his teenage lover, stayed in the house for over a week, living the high life, getting busy like a couple of homicidal rabbits. Carol Ann would later claim that she wasn't at the house when the murders took place. Starkweather testified that she was, and that she gladly lent a hand, especially in the beating and the murder of a two-year-old half-sister. And he took a polygraph test and passed. This is known by criminal psychologists as folly a deux. Literally, a madness shared by two. And I guess that's hard to argue that the couple must have been mental to be fucking while the mother's next to him, stuffed down the shitter, slowly dying with her dead and mutilated baby sister laying on top of that shitter in a cardboard box. And to make sure that no nosy relatives came poking around, Carol wrote a note telling everybody that the family had the flu 
happened to stay away, and it worked a charm. It was after seven days that the grandmother growing suspicious came to the house and told the couple if they didn't let her in, she'd call the police. And they both knew that the gig were up. So Starkweather and Fugate packed a few possessions and the murderous Romeo and Juliet were now on the run again. And when the backwater cops found the bodies a day later, the town was in shock, but they still thought it was just a one-off. It was in the small town of Bennett, 20 miles east of Lincoln, that the couple would strike next. A family friend and hunting buddy of Charlie's father. It was around lunchtime on January 27th that the couple arrived at the house of August Maya. And as the car pulled up, they got stuck in the mud and walked up to the house. Charlie testified that when August opened the front door, he was holding a shotgun, but many believe this highly unlikely. Either way, Charlie shot him point blank in the face, killing him instantly. They dragged the body of the 70-year-old farmer and put him outside in a cleaning cupboard. And after the couple celebrated in August Meyer's bed, they checked the house for valuables. And then they feasted on cookies and jello that they'd found in the pantry. While the dead farmer lay outside, having none. As darkness fell, the couple now started to feel restless. Because this game that they were playing had become easy. They now had the hunger. Under the cover of darkness, with their car stuck in the mud, they left Maya's house and started out on foot. And as the deadly duel walked along the side of the road, a vehicle pulled up, good Samaritans perhaps, and the two teens inside offered the murderous couple a lift. Robert Jensen and Carol King were in love and just got engaged and soon to be married. But that marriage would not happen. They were brought to an abandoned cellar that was once part of a schoolhouse. And Carol, who had been planning to have her cherry popped on a wedding day by Robert, well, it didn't go to plan. It was after one of Maya's family members found his body the next day, the police started searching the property and stumbled across the two teens. Jenkins had been shot seven times and he was missing his head. And King, she'd been shot once in the face. Naked below the waist, raped, a pussy cut out and thrown a short distance away. And I'm paraphrasing here, but I'm guessing the cops would have thought, who would cut out a pussy and throw it away in a field? The two 16-year-olds had been popular and by all accounts didn't have an enemy in the world. But I guess the Reaper don't distinguish from popular and non-popular. Starkwell, who would later deny killing and cutting up King, blamed his girlfriend. Said that when he fucked King, she told him that she was a virgin. And this made Carol Ann furious, so she took a knife and gave her the business and finished her off with a slug to the face. Now in Jensen's car, the couple headed west, trying to get as far away as they could from the murders. Headed to Washington State, where Starkweather's brother lived. But while they were on the road, close to their destination, for reasons that have never been stated, they turned around and headed back to Lincoln. What happened next would horrify the whole nation. Around 8.30 on the 28th of January, Starkweather and Fugate entered a mansion in the wealthy area of Lincoln and held the occupants Clara Ward and her deaf maid at gunpoint. Who hires a deaf maid? Isn't listening part of the job description? What's with the headgear? She in a harem? It was around 6.30 p.m. that Clara's rich industrialist husband returned home. The next morning when he failed to show up at a meeting, Suspicions were raised and the police were called. When the police entered the house, Mr. Ward was found just inside the front door, shot once in the back and once in the temple. His wife was found lying nude in the master bedroom with multiple stab wounds and she'd been raped. The deaf maid was found tied up to her bed 
with too many stab wounds to count, and she'd be given the same treatment as the virgin had back in the cellar, and I guess it's safe to say, she never heard a thing. Well, since discovering the last three bodies, which makes a total of nine that we know of so far, Mayor Martin and I have made an appeal for all adjoining counties, including Omaha, to send all available help they can to Lincoln. It is our opinion that the car is still in this vicinity. We know he has been for the last three days, and we want to cover Lincoln block to block. But the hillbilly detectives were as wrong as the maid was deaf, because the serial killing Romeo and Juliet were on the run again. Now the small town were in terror, with vigilantes walking the streets with guns. Everybody wanted a piece of the two young killers who believed that cutting out someone's pussy were fun. Now, halfway to Washington, on the way to hide out at Charlie's brother, the renegade lovers, driving the Ward's fancy stolen car with Wisconsin plates, realized that they were less than discreet and pulled into the nearest town to trade up. It was there they came across 37-year-old traveling salesman Merle Collison sleeping in his car. His dark weather walked up, shot him nine times, and pushed him on the floor. Poor Merle's selling days were over. That's unless they do it in heaven. But dim-witted Stockwell couldn't figure out how to release the handbrake, and as he sat there loudly cursing, a good Samaritan walked up and offered to help. To which Stockweather pointed his gun in his face and said, yeah, take off the handbrake. But I guess he messed with the wrong good Samaritan. Because the man took the rifle out of Charlie's hands and wrestled him to the ground. It was then when a police officer from across the street spotted the commotion and started to head towards them. That Carol Ann, probably sensing that the gig were up, got out of the car and ran towards the officer crying, saying, help me, I've been kidnapped by Charlie Starkweather. Starkweather, seeing this, pulled himself away, got into the car, and sped away. Now, being pursued by the police forces of three separate counties and over 20 cars, Starkweather, being shot at, gets hit in the ear and immediately pulls over and gives himself up. And the killing spree is now over. And once in custody, Starkweather found out that his so-called soulmate had turned on him like a retard with a hammer at a sleepover party. Do you think he would even implicate you in that if you didn't have anything at all to do with it? Why do you think he'd want to implicate you? Well, by now I'm sure he hates me. For running away. He's trying to make it look like I'm just still doing things. Had you gone with him for quite a while? Yes, I'd went with him a year before and then I told him I didn't want to see him again, but he came back. And after that Sunday, I went with him, and then I kept telling him to leave. And at that Sunday, I told him to leave, and I told him I didn't ever want to see him again. Why? What had, uh, what had brought you to this conclusion? Why didn't you want to go with him anymore? I think he's crazy.
devil never sleeps